Mancha's Farm in Colgate, Wisconsin. And how many of you have been to Mancha's Farm? Very nice, thank you, I appreciate that. For those of you who haven't, um, we're about an hour's drive from here, uh, about 30 miles northwest of downtown Milwaukee. Um, we've been growing perennials for 33 years now. We grow about 2,000 varieties of hardy field grown perennials as well as unusual annuals and tropicals. We also have a gift shop with antiques and uh, we do custom dried floral uh, design and that sort of thing. Um, we're on a uh, rustic designated with Wisconsin uh, Rustic Road. It's really a beautiful drive out there, so I'd love to have you come visit us sometime. Um, we present our plants in kind of a unique way in that we plant, we pot up the plants, we sink the pot in the ground, and they stay in the ground there until they go home with a gardener. So our plants are all out there in the sales yard now. We do cover them with straw for the winter months. As soon as things thaw in the spring, we'll be raking the straw off, and uh, you will know that plant's already been through a Wisconsin winter. Uh, when you take it home to your garden. So what we're gonna be talking about today is common mistakes that beginning perennial gardeners make and how to avoid them. And I hate to start with soil because I know that for so many people, sno soil is just a snoozer and you know you kind of lose people right from the get-go. But it's, it, it is absolutely the foundation of uh, developing a good perennial garden. And it's one of the few mistakes that you can't easily go back and correct after the fact. Um, so in planning your garden, uh, it really makes sense to get the soil prepared correctly because you're gonna have such a more satisfactory experience. Um, no matter how wonderful the plants are that you put into your garden, if you haven't, if you don't have good soil, um, you're not gonna have success and it's not gonna be a good experience for you. So um, how do you, go about figuring out, out how to amend the soil. First, you wanna know what your existing soil is. And um, the soil is determined by the underlying bedrock. And the fact that we had, have had glaciation in southern Wisconsin really makes that kind of a complicated situation. I live in uh, West Bend and on the south side of town, the soil is very clay and loam, and on the north side of town, it's very sandy. So don't assume that your soil is the same as your friend or your neighbor just because they live in your proximity. It really, soil types can vary greatly within a very small locality because of the glaciation. Um, the va basic types of soil uh, that you'll find in this area are sandy soil, which, um, I mean, these things are sort of, you know, obvious, but uh, they have, it, the part, soil particles are very large, so um, the roots can grow very readily through them. Plants actually love to grow in sand and grow very well in sand. The problem is that nutrients and moisture passes very readily through sandy soil. So you need to constantly be supplementing those if you're growing in a real sandy soil. Um, and the opposite extreme, you have the clay soil, which has very small uh, soil particles, tends to hold water and tends to become very waterlogged. It's also very difficult for um, roots to penetrate, particularly when it dries. It can become almost like concrete. Um, and, but it is a more nutrient-rich soil than the sandy soil. And the way that you would um, Take either of these extremes and make them into the ideal garden soil, which is loam, would be by adding organic matter. Either to clay soil or to sandy soil, the addition of organic matter is gonna give you your desirable uh, end soil, which is loam. Some people think if you take a clay soil and you add sand, uh, that makes it drain more readily. In fact, it doesn't, it actually worsens the situation. So if you are going to, um, bring in new soil. And this is what we often do with our beds. I don't know if I have a pointer on here or not. I don't think I do. But th we prepare the garden bed and then we actually bring in and berm up um, with introduced soil. And if you're purchasing soil, you wanna make sure you don't buy just what is often called brown topsoil or black topsoil, because a lot of times you're gonna be just be buying in what you already have um, as your native soil. 
So you really want to buy in a blended mix. And if you are working with a reputable dealer and you tell them what you're after, you know, they can help you pick out what that mix is. It's going to vary depending upon, you know, who the distributor is. But basically you want soil that's actually mixed with some sort of organic matter, some sort of compost. We sometimes actually start with a plant starter mix, which is usually used for nurseries to establish our beds. And if you are going to be um, adding to your existing soil, um, you want to bring in organic matter. And we have found that the absolute um, best compost we can purchase is what's called mushroom compost. And in the Milwaukee area, um, we get it uh, from a place called Certified Products in New Berlin, but I'm sure it's available other places also. It's just phenomenal stuff. You mix, you mix, if you mix your organic matter with your native soil about one-third to two-thirds, you till that in, you just get amazing performance from your plants. Um, if you want to know what you have in terms of uh, nutrient content and that sort of thing in your existing soil, um, the, the best thing to do is to take a soil sample. And because the soil can really vary even within your own piece of property, you usually are going to want to take a number of soil samples from throughout your property and submit them to the UW Soil Testing Lab. Um, I didn't print out handouts uh, for today, but um, all this information, you don't have to write down these websites and stuff, because all this information is available on our website, manchasfarm.com. If you go to the latest news page, um, there's a link to a three or four page handout that has all this information on it that you can print out. Um, so if you, if you send your soil into the UW Soil Testing Lab, they're going to tell you what the nutrient content is, what the pH is, and what they would recommend recommend in terms of additions. And there are many, many soil nutrients, but the, the three that are considered the primary nutrients because they are most um, used by plants and they move most readily through the soil and therefore are the ones that you most frequently have to supplement are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when you see a fertilizer bag and it has the three numbers, 10, 10, 10, or 10, 25, or whatever, those are what the three numbers are. The first number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, and the last number is potassium. The nitrogen tends to push a lot of uh, leafy growth. So that's why uh, lawn fertilizers will have a high first number. If you're growing, if your emphasis is on growing fruit or on trying to produce blossoms, usually you're looking for a higher middle number because the phosphorus is what affects that type of growth. Although our native soils in Wisconsin do tend to naturally be quite high in phosphorus. And the potassium just sort of... Um, is for overall plant health. Soil pH is another consideration. Uh, this, is, just like the soil type, is determined by the underlying bedrock. So again, in southern Wisconsin, where we have limestone, our soils tend to be very alkaline. You get a little bit more acidity uh, in the northern part of the state. And this affects the type of plants you grow. Plants that like to grow in a more acidic soil, uh, and just a couple examples here, rhododendron and blueberries, are unable to pick up the nutrients they need out of a more alkaline soil. So they do not tend to thrive. And that's why um, these plants you'll struggle uh, to succeed with. Another thing, and that many people have some awareness of this, um, but maybe a little bit of misunderstanding of the plants that are influenced, sometimes the flower color can be influenced by soil um, pH. In very, very few plants, um, the big leaf hydrangeas or the hydrangea macrophylla, um, which are the ones that can produce the blue flower heads, those ones will change color depending upon the soil acidity. They'll be blue in acid soil, they'll be pink in alkaline soil. And that's why um, oftentimes when you, if you buy one of these at the nursery and it's blue when you get it, it may be pink in future years if it blooms at all, quite frankly, because many of them don't tend to be bud hardy here. But it, that does not apply to um, the other two species of hydrangea that you frequently see, the snowball type, um, the uh, uh, hydrangea arborescens, and the hydrangea paniculata, which is the fall blooming one. Those two, um, they're going to be white, fading to green or rose color, regardless of the soil acidity. But a lot of people want to try to 
grow blueberries or they want to try to get that blue hydrangea color. And you can supplement the soils um, with aluminum uh, sulfate to make them more acidic. But I really think probably the best approach is to grow plants that are better adapted to growing in the soil that you actually have. You're almost fighting a losing battle to try to be constantly changing the soil pH around that plant. It can be done, um, but it's sort of a short-term fix. So moving on from soils, um, putting a garden or a plant in the wrong place. So the solution to this, obviously, you want to evaluate your site and you want to research your plant selection. Uh, your site considerations would be, number one, which we already talked about, the soil type, the pH, and the nutrient content, the sun exposure, um, the moisture levels, and then what I'm calling special considerations. So sun exposure, a lot of people will say, well, you know, I don't have full sun in that spot, thinking that full sun means that there is not one bit of shade, it's blasting sun all day. Full sun for a plant really means five or more hours of sun a day. So you have a lot more versatility than I think a lot of people think, that, and they think they're restricted to shade plants if they don't have that really, truly full sun all day. If you have five or more hours, that is full sun as far as a plant is concerned. And three to five five hours partial shade, two to three hours shade, and zero to two hours is dense shade. And you really also want to consider the source of the shade. I mean, if you're underneath a tree, depending upon the density of the canopy cover, uh, underneath a locust tree, you know, there may be dappled light throughout the day down there. Underneath a maple tree, it's quite dense, but the but the worst shade to try to deal with is that that's cast by structures or by buildings. So on the north side of the house, um, there may literally be no sun that ever hits that spot. And that certainly becomes a challenge um, in plant selection. Moisture levels, drainage issues, and access to water. I mean, there may be an area, um, certainly this has to do with your soil type also, but if there's an area that floods in the spring, you know, you're going to want to uh, have plants that can tolerate that, being submerged for some period of time. Um, if there's an area that's very dry, a slope that drains really quickly. But lastly, and I think some people don't think about this, access to water. How readily can you get your hose to that spot? I mean, it's a lot easier to water plants that are right in your foundation planting, but if you're going to put your perennial garden way at the back of your property, you're going to have to put three lengths of hose on in order to get to it, you're probably not going to water it as frequently as you really need to. So think about, the, think about access to water also. And special considerations could be many, many things, but some of the, some of the most prominent that, that I run into, number one, high winds. Um, we do tend to get a lot of high winds running across, you know, what used to be the prairie here um, in southern Wisconsin. So plants that have sort of tender stems that might not withstand those winds, you want to have, you know, sturdy, sturdy stem perennials for a windy site or possibly some sort of screening. Um, areas where kids or dogs are running. You know, if there's going to be a lot of foot traffic, you definitely are going to want to pick plants that can take a little bit of, of abuse. And salt runoff. If it's next to a walkway or um, a driveway and you're going to have salt running off, you really want to consider, number one, there are products that you can use that different alternatives for de-icing besides salt. Um, but if you are going to be using salt, you may want to select plants for those areas that have higher salt tolerance. And we do have um, a number of special use lists on our website. Again, manchasfarm.com. It's the this and that page. And I did put a link to that page on our latest news uh, section also, if you want to access some of these lists. These are lists of uh, plants that are salt tolerant, plants that are drought tolerant, plants that will grow in a wet site, perennials. Another common mistake is planting invasive plants. Um, how many of you know what the plant is that's in that picture? Well, this is, this is what's called um, Lysomachia clethroides or gooseneck loosestrife. Now, we all know of the pink loosestrife as an invasive plant, it's actually illegal to grow in this state. Um, that's that's uh, Lychnis salicaria. It's actually a completely unrelated plant, but they just happen to have the same common name, and we're going to talk about 
uh, botanical nomenclature later also. But it's a this is a beautiful plant. It has that kind of gooseneck-shaped flower. Um, it's really very pretty, lovely um, cut flower. And when I was first introduced to this plant, um, I was told, oh, it's so great because it weaves the garden together. Well, indeed, it does. And... Um, and I think a lot of times people, when they start out gardening, they, they're really drawn to some of these plants that tend to be invasive. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, a lot of times beginning gardeners start out, start out by obtaining their plants at plant exchanges. And there's a lot of nice plants at plant exchanges, but you really need to be knowledgeable about what you're acquiring there, because a lot of times the reason that the plant is at the plant exchange is because that person had a whole bunch of it in their yard. And so um, a lot of times there's some not really great plants um, at those plant exchanges. Plus when you come into the nursery and the plant that most appeals to you is the one that just looks so gorgeous and big and full and healthy in the pot. Well, again, those oftentimes are the plants that are that are very aggressive, and you know these are kind of the catchwords you'll want to look for in signage or in catalogs are you know vigorous, enthusiastic, um, or eager. Uh, you know, might want to steer away from those plants. <laughs> And, and this plant that we're seeing here in the pot, this is, this is taken at Mancha's Farm. This is a plant that we sell, and it's actually a plant that I really like. It's, a, it's, a, it's called a mountain mint, pycnanthemum. It's actually a native prairie plant. But you see what it's doing? It's trying to leap out of the pot, and you can see that's how it's gonna grow. Many members of the mint family do grow this way. So, I mean, it's a fine plant, but you need to have an awareness going in of what the behavior of that plant is gonna be, and do you want, do you want that in that site? Um, there are two kinds of, of plants that can be invasive. One are plants that run from the roots like this, and the other is plants that seed. And I actually find the plants that seed a little easier to deal with because if you get in there and you deadhead them, um, you don't have so much of that issue. Plus, you can you know, pull out the seedlings. These ones that run can really be terrible because they get into your other perennials and up, they're coming up 20 feet away and, and I, I have a little more of a problem with those. But just as with the plant exchanges, be a little bit... Um, cautious about generous neighbors who are sharing things with you um, because oftentimes it's the plants that they have way too much of. And, and when you go to the nursery, try to shop at nurseries that have knowledgeable staff that can help you with your plant selection. And there's lots of wonderful nurseries represented here at the Garden Expo, so it's a great starting point. Um, another mistake, buying all of your plants at once and not remembering about the change of seasons. And I see this a lot. People come in, they decide they're going to put in a perennial garden, so they come in in May and they buy all the really pretty plants in May. Well, what are you going to pick? You're going to pick all the plants that are blooming in May. So you're going to have a really nice garden in May. You might have a nice garden going into June, but there's absolutely nothing going on in July, August, September, October. Most perennials... Um, in exchange for them living year to year, bloom for two to three weeks. Uh, some of them will bloom as long as six weeks. Those are the really long blooming ones. But so you really have to make sure you're selecting plants that are gonna be um, blooming over the course of the entire season. And here's just um, looking at the same garden in different seasons to see, you know, how things change over the course of the season. You want something going on throughout the season. So how do you, you know, get away from that mistake? Number one, give yourself a few years to, um, to build your garden. You don't have to plant it all that first year. That way you can experiment with plants. You can buy, you know, one or two of this. And, you know, ideally they say, well, you want to have sweeps of plants. You want to have three or five. You know, that's fine, and ultimately that's true, but I think when you're really starting out, it's not a bad idea to buy one of these, one of these, put them in, see how they they grow in your area, see how you like them, and see how they thrive, and if you want to add to them. Um, so do give yourself a, a, a number of years. Allow yourself to fill in the empty spaces with annuals those first years. Sometimes people, and I'm going to talk about this too, they're very purists. No, we only want perennials, we don't want any annuals. Well, some annuals really are very flamboyant, and they don't necessarily look, um, they don't necessarily partner better with some of the more subtle beauty of perennials. But there 
there are a lot of really nice, um, more sort of understated annuals that will combine nicely with your perennial garden. So think about filling in your spaces the first few years with those annuals. Um, shop throughout the year. So go to the nursery in May, but go again in June, go again in July, you know, go once a month, once every six weeks, and buy a couple of plants that are blooming during each visit so that you know that you're gonna have something blooming every month of the year in your garden. This will only work if you go to a nursery that's actually, you know, like Manchas or any other sort of, you know, higher quality perennial nursery where they're actually kind of growing the plants in situ and you're being able to see how they behave. If you go to the Kmart, you know, you don't know they bought that stuff in, you don't know if it's actually blooming on its regular schedule, et cetera. And excellent, go to garden tours and botanic gardens. Um, botanic gardens are great because they have a lot of signage with a lot of information, um, but garden tours are possibly the best because you're at a botanic gardens, they have paid staff that are out there taking care of the plants, they're obviously gonna look their best. When you go to another home gardener on a garden tour, you're seeing what's actually growing um, in a home gardener's backyard in your area and what's looking good. You can talk to the person about their experience. Uh, garden tours are really fantastic. And we do um, publish a list of uh, every summer of garden tours in the Milwaukee area on our website. And include bulbs. Bulbs are a great way to extend the season to the extremes in both um, both directions, starting as early as March, you know, with things like this, this is the snowdrops, and this is called glory of the snow. This also oftentimes comes right up through the snow in March and April. Um, a couple of scenes we're gonna look at here where you think what would you be looking at in that garden if those bulbs weren't there? And the answer is, Nothing, it would just be brown earth. So here are the winter aconites and the pushkinia. This is probably early April. And this whole area that you see there, it's all uh, Corydalus bulbosa. It's a, it's a bulbous type of Corydalus. Many of you may be familiar with the yellow blooming one. This one has a lavender flower. And then it goes, most of these bulbs then go very quickly dormant. So they're completely gone by the time your perennials come up. So they just give you a whole nother season of color. Um, another advantage of these really early season bulbs is that you see this area the leaves aren't out on the trees yet. So this area will be a shaded area during the growing season, but it's sun in the spring. So you can get a lot of color very, very early in the season in what you know you might think of as your shade garden where you're not thinking you can get a lot of color because in fact, it's sun at the time of year when these plants are actively growing. And again, just think of that scene if you didn't have that bulb there, it would just be brown earth. Crocuses, of course, we're all familiar with. Now going to the other end of the season, um, this is uh, surprise lily, uh, it has a number of interesting uh, common names, surprise lily, resurrection lily, naked ladies. Um, what it does is it comes up in the spring with a green strap-like foliage, which many people don't even notice, they don't even know the plant has leaves because it's at a time when there's a lot of other things going on in the garden. And then in the fall, well, late summer, early fall, it has these tall stems that come up with these amaryllis type flowers. And um, just as with the other, with the early season bulbs, this will grow in quite a bit of shade. And it's just a really a fun plant. And it's nice to have, sometimes the gardens are starting to look a little tired as you get later in the season. It's nice to have something fresh and new coming up uh, that late in the season. This would be August into September. And it, it partners, because it will grow in the shade, it partners really well with, with hostas. And if you interplant it with hostas, it'll come up through the hosta foliage. And we do have a, a, a beautiful big hosta at the farm with one of these planted underneath it. And people are always asking us in the autumn what that variety of hosta is. <laughs> And another one that's really, really late, this is well into October, is the colchicum. It's often called autumn crocus, but it's not, in fact, a true crocus. Um, again, it comes up with the green leaves in the spring, and then those die down. There's nothing there in the summer, so you might want to mark this to make sure you're not planting something, you know, putting your spade through it. But uh, this plant 
just has these beautiful, and they're large. The flowers are about this big, so they look like a crocus, but they're quite large. And they're really spectacular at that time of year when everything else is kind of slowing down and getting ready to quit, and this is coming up fresh and new. And we, a couple years ago, I had a gal come in, and she said, you know, I'm really disappointed in you guys. I cannot believe that you have artificial flowers out in the garden. So... <laughs> And this is a double blooming form called water lily. Uh, mistake, not checking the hardiness zone. The USDA uh, plant hardiness zone, um, pl each plant is given a, a rating in what zones it's hardy in. Basically, we in this area are, in Madison, you're probably like four, and in Milwaukee, we're five. So you want to know, is that plant hardy? to that zone. We write all of our own signage at the farm, and we do try to indicate the hardiness, but some plants, and we grow most of our plants, but some plants we do buy in finished because we can't get you know these great big tropical plants. We can't grow those to maturity in a financially realistic way in our climate, so we buy in a lot of these tropicals um, from the West Coast. And they come in with tags in the pot, and they're oftentimes a picture tag, so we'll leave that plant, that tag in there. Um, and the customers will read it, and it will say perennial on it, because it is perennial in California where it was grown. Um, so you, but if you look closely, those tags will also, they always will have the zone on them. And, and then it'll say perennial zone eight. Well, then you know it's not going to be perennial here. But that's a really common mistake that people make, especially when you're shopping at the big box stores. So you see the tag, it says perennial, and so you think it's a perennial. Well, it is, but it's not perennial in Wisconsin in zone four or five. Mistake, weeding out perennial plants and nurturing weeds. And with perennials, I mean, it can be challenging because, um, because they're not blooming all the time like an annual. You do have to kind of learn what they look like and know that that's a desirable plant. That's another advantage of building your garden a little bit slowly rather than putting everything in all at once. You know, you, if you take your time, you put a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you kind of get to know those plants um, as you grow with them. Um, but there are other ways you can deal with this. Um, a, a really good solution is labeling plants, labeling your perennials as you put them in. Label If you're planting a number of them label at least one so that you know that plant that looks like that is supposed to be there. And there's a number of ways to label plants. You can just put the little plastic tag that came with them in their pot in the ground next to them. That'll work certainly for the first season. But we really like these zinc garden labels. And there's a number of ways to use them. Um, what I like best are these little handheld label makers. They're basically like a miniature laser printer. And if you get the clear label with black on them and then um, they have a, an adhesive on the back, you'll get a label that looks like like this here. And it's a really professional looking label. And, and many of them, these can last up to a decade. They really last forever. Um, if you have a laser printer at home, you can print these on your computer. But most of us have inkjet printers. If you have an inkjet printer, as soon as it gets wet, that'll run off. You can also write on these zinc tags with any type of permanent marker, whether it be a Sharpie or a paint pen. Um, they have uh, permanent pencils. But no matter what you use to write on them, they always fade on the front. So what we do, if we're going to have to write on them, we write on the back, too. So that once that front fades, you've still got it written on the back. You know what it is. You can rewrite it on the front again. And um, then you may want to know what the five or six most problematic weeds in your area are. Um, the only one, I mean, I could have a whole talk on Wisconsin weeds, but the only one I'm going to specifically talk about um, is the garlic mustard. Uh, the garlic mustard is a biennial plant, meaning that the first, it lives for two years. The first year it puts up its foliage, 
does not bloom. The second year it comes up, then it blooms, sets seed, and the cycle starts over again. It's a very, very problematic plant uh, in Wisconsin and throughout the Midwest. It's completely wiping out some of, some of our native woodland vegetation areas. So if you have it on your property, you do need to make an effort to get rid of it. When it's in the vegetative state the first year, you can apply um, herbicide to it, although it does require frequent applications, a single application won't kill it, or you can pull it. When it's in the blooming year, when it's in the second year, um, you need to pull it and you need, you can't, even if you pull it real early before the flowers have all set, it's very adaptable. That's usually how Weeds become weeds, they're very adaptable. It can set seed, if you pull that plant and throw it aside to dry, it looks like it's dead, it still can set viable seed. So you need to bag and remove these plants. Um, either burn them or bag them and get them off the property. The garbage men will take them, you do need to label them invasive plant material and they'll, they'll take your, your black bags of these. So don't pull it and let it, throw it on the ground the way you can with most weeds. Um, it was introduced um, intentionally as many weeds and exotic animals that become problematic are um, and because it's an herb. It has a garlic flavor to it, you can eat it. It's actually quite tasty. So if you want to harvest it in its early, in its first year stage, um, when the leaves are young, just as you would want to harvest most edible plants, um, in an area on your property that you know has not been sprayed with herbicides, you can make a great pesto out of it. And we have a recipe on our website, again, on the this and that page. Um, it, then if you want to have an idea what some of the other really common weeds are, there's lots of great websites out there. I just did a quick search and this is one that I found that I thought was very well done for identifying um, weeds and it's, uh, it's the National Gardening Association. Again, all this information is on, on the handout. The handout that you can find on our website. Um, and mistake not considering native wildlife. Um, we have, I imagine you have it here, certainly in the Milwaukee area, tremendous problem with deer. Um, and, and rabbits vary from year to year. Their population, um, you know, really is very cyclic. Uh, down in the bottom is some tulips. We don't, we don't do tulips at all anymore because they're such a good, plant. They're really, really tasty. And we've even had customers that have had their dogs dig up their tulip bulbs and eat them because they really are good. So um, <laughs> the solution is, is planting deer and rabbit resistant plants. And you'll find a list again on our, on our website on the this and that page. But as a basic rule of thumb, the plants that the, the deer and rabbits don't like to eat are plants that, um, plants with silver foliage, Plants that are very highly scented, so most herbs or members of the mint family they will not like to eat. As a general rule, they, they don't eat allium, the ornamental onions, although we have had years when, they've, when they have done that. And plants that are toxic, and those are the ones you probably wouldn't know off the top of your head, so it's handy to have a list of those things like the, the digitalis or foxglove, the, um, the helleborus, the lenten rose, uh, the aconitum, uh, are plants that are actually toxic. And and the animals know that and they don't eat them. Um, if, you already, if there are certain plants you love and you want to grow despite the fact that you know the deer like to eat them, um, then you might want to consider spring um, repellents. Most repellents um, that are on the market are effective, but they have to be reapplied frequently. Most of them tend to be rather on the expensive side and the the active ingredient, if you will, in most of them is egg. And so you can actually make uh, a very effective deer repellent yourself for free. And this recipe, again, is, is on the handout, um, but it's just eggs, milk, um, oil, and we use hot chili oil. 
uh, just as an extra taste deterrent, and dishwashing liquid, which makes it uh, stick to the foliage. You have to let that uh, ferment. What I do is I save the empty milk carton with just that little bit of milk in the bottom, add the rest of the ingredients, and you just fill it up with water, set it someplace to become fragrant for a week or so, and then I screen it through like a little uh, sieve, and then I put like a nylon stocking or something on the sieve and pour that into my sprayer so that you don't get any lumps that are gonna clog up your sprayer. It smells really terrible, but that's the idea. And, um, and it's very effective, and it usually lasts a couple of weeks. Um, it does last through rain. Um, most the deer are deterred mostly by scent, rabbits more by taste. So it's the hot pepper element that is effective for the rabbits. So if it's rabbits you're trying to, to get rid of then or trying to discourage, then you want to make sure and include that hot pepper element. Mistake being too much of a purist. I kind of touched on this before with, oh, I only want to do perennials. I don't want to have any annuals. Um, a lot of times um, people will come in starting out, they only want pastel flowers. That's very, very common with beginner gardeners. They don't want any yellow, any orange. And um, a lot of the longest blooming plants, actually, a lot of the longest blooming perennials do have yellow flowers. And and I, when I start, I was a huge daily collector for many, many years, and at one point I had about 400 varieties of daylilies in my garden, and I wanted all the pastels. That's what I wanted. I wanted cream and pink and lemon, and, and um, somebody gave me as a gift uh, an orange daylily. And I thought, oh, you know. But I put it in my garden, and I found, I kept looking at that that place where that orange daylily was. That's where my eye was drawn. And and then I shifted, and now I have a lot of those really vibrant colors because it, they really add a lot of zing to the garden. If you just have a garden that's all pastels, it's not exciting. It's not fun, you know. I mean, it, try and, and also all white. So many people, all white. I can't have anything that's not white. So, you know, be creative. Let, let yourself experiment um, and try some other things. Don't be, don't lock yourself in to what your original idea may have been. Uh, mistake, uh, needing to have the latest new thing and believing everything you read. <laughs> um, <laughs> Horticulture, the uh, marketing of horticultural plants has changed dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years. And now there's many, many plants um, on the market now that are patented. So that every purchase of that plant, um, the originator gets a portion of the proceeds. So there's incentive for constantly introducing new plants and patenting them um, and marketing them. And what happens as a result is that a lot of the really great old time plants are, get crowded out of the market because people are clamoring for the plants they're seeing advertised all the time. And there's multi-million dollar advertising uh, campaigns for some of these plants now. So have an awareness of that and do realize, too, that they're always going to be, they think the gardener wants something new. So they're going to try to be constantly introducing something new. And many of these plants are not necessarily better. And a lot of times there'll be a lot of noise made about a new plant that comes on the market, and they tend to be very expensive when they first come out. I say, wait. Don't, you don't need to have it the first year. Let your neighbor or your friend be the first one to have it and then watch and see what happens because a lot of these plants, they're not even around three years later. They just disappear because they don't turn out to be really good garden performers. Um, so be patient and be a little skeptical. So how do you know when you read about some plant that's supposed to be great how much of a grain of salt you should take what you're reading with. Well, there are some organizations. Um, this is the Wisconsin Nurserymen's Association. Well, their goal, obviously, is to sell plants. I mean, we want you to buy plants. That's what we do for business. But we also want you to buy a really good plant that you're going to love and be successful with so you come back and buy more. And so the Wisconsin Nurserymen Association each year picks a perennial plant of the year and a woody plant of the year. 
and these tend to be really fantastic plants. Their selections are excellent. Um, so any plants that an organization like this is promoting do tend to be um, something that's worth um, considering. And we do have a list of the Wisconsin uh, Perennial Plant of the Year on our website. Also the Perennial Plant Association, which is a national organization of perennial plant growers, each year uh, select a perennial plant of the year. Their criteria are um, suitable for a wide range of climatic conditions, low maintenance requirements, um, relatively pest and disease resistance, ready availability in the year of promotion and multiple seasons of ornamental interest. Those are all great goals and I would say for the most part, the plants that they select really meet those qualifications. And the perennial plant of the year um, are usually really, really good choices. And again, that you'll find a list on our website of those plants. Um, the All-American Selections. The, the difference between the, the All-American Selections and the other two we just talked about is the other two they can pick from any plant. These could have been plants that have been on the market for years and years. Um, all-American selections do tend to be their new introductions. Um, they're, you know, the grower will provide these plants for evaluation, but um, they're being evaluated in a very um, objective way. It's an independent, nonprofit organization that does not advertise, and the. They're putting them through these trials. So where do you go to see these trials? You can actually go and look at these plants being trialed at these various locations, um, you know, nearby. And it's really very interesting because you can go and they'll have a huge bed of all different salvias or all different petunias or whatever it might be. And, and you can compare them yourself and see which ones are blooming most heavily, which ones um, you know, are sprawling all over the place, which ones have nicer habit. It's really nice to have these trial gardens open to the public. And then the, the American Garden Award, and usually these, well like at, at uh, Burner Botanic Gardens in Milwaukee, they have, um, these trials are there, and you can actually vote you know, as a visitor to the gardens, you can vote, and you're determining which ones are going to be getting the award. Now, on the flip side of that is the Proven Winners program. Now, you see the wording here, Proven Winners is a leading brand. And their reason for existence is, you know, they want to have unique, high-performing plants, but they want to market the plants. And so it's a brand, and a lot of, this is what we receive in the mail from the Proven Winners program. Expect your, expect your customers to ask for blah, 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 whatever it might be, because we're gonna advertise it. And they spend a lot of money advertising these plants. And sometime it can be difficult to tell the difference between advertising and editorial. So just you know, maybe try to look carefully when you see something in a woman's magazine um, about a, you know, a big full page thing about a plant is it an ad or is it actually an article? And if it's an ad, you know, maybe let that plant prove itself um, before you go out and invest a lot of money in it for your garden. Um, mistake not using botanical nomenclature. Well, what is botanical nomenclature? Uh, it's binomial nomenclature, meaning bi, which is two, and nomenclature, um, nomen is name. So you have two, every plant, has a common name, like we were talking about the loose strife, where there are two plants that both have the common name loose strife, but they're completely unrelated plants. Um, so one is Lithrum salicaria, the other is Lysomachia clethroides. They each have a genus and a species name. And to, think, to understand how that works, a genus would be like the equivalent of your last name. So if you're Alice Smith, everybody in the Smith family may share certain characteristics that you can tell, well, that's a Smith. But your Alice Smith, that's the specific name or the species name, that describes you exactly. Alice Smith is the only person that fits that exact description. And so if you know the genus and the species name, you know that you're asking for exactly the right plant. You know, if you read about some plant or if you go on a garden tour, oh, I really like that, and they say, oh, well, that's a, a 
cup flour or something. Well, can you tell me, do you have any more information than that? You know, do you know the scientific name? Because if you go to the nursery and you ask for the cup flour, you know, who knows what that is? Um, you're gonna know exactly what you're talking about if you have the genus and the species. And just the genus isn't gonna do it. Because here, say, this is phlox. Well, there's all different types of phlox, ranging from the tall garden phlox to, to low creeping phlox. Well, if say, okay, it was a creeping phlox. Well, there's two entirely different plants that are called creeping phlox. The one on the top is phlox stolonifera, that's a woodland ground cover. And the one on the bottom is Phlox subulata, that's a rock garden plant for full sun. They're both called creeping phlox. Just to complicate the issue, the one on the bottom is also called pinks. And pinks is the common name for dianthus or carnations. So that's why it really uh, does behoove you to know these scientific names. And when you get down to the species level, so that's Phlox paniculata, the tall garden phlox. That, um, Species name can actually tell you information about the plant itself. It's usually in a language you don't know, you know, it's either Greek or it's Latin usually. But you can learn what some of these names mean and it actually tells you some characteristics of the plant. So in this situation, Phlox paniculata, it means the flower, it flowers in a panicle. You know, the flower is in the form of a panicle. But alba is white, atropurpurea would be purple. It can even tell you about the growing conditions. Let's see, palustris. If the, if the species name is palustris, that wants to grow in a wet area. Um, most of them are just descriptive, the other ones that are on there. But you know, you really can get a lot of information out of the naming. It can be quite, quite interesting to begin to understand what these names mean. And, you know, so you've narrowed it down to Phlox paniculata. You know, even if you went into the nursery and said, oh, I want Phlox paniculata, well, there's probably well over 100 different varieties of Phlox paniculata. So you really want to know also the cultivar or the variety name. In this case, Phlox paniculata shockwave, that's this variegated one. But, you know, there's um, any number of named varieties, the cultivar, which means it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a variety that was developed by plant breeders is what a cultivar is, and it's shown in single quotes like that. Mistake, selecting a plant solely on the basis of its flowers, we all, do this, it's just human nature. But it really, um, and this is another reason that it's good to sort of take your time establishing your perennial garden and maybe not invest in huge waves of one thing till you find out how you like its performance. You also want to consider what its foliage, habit, form, and texture is going to be because the vast majority of the time, other than that three to four weeks that the plant is blooming, that's what you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at the foliage and the habit and the texture and the form. Form. And so you want that to be attractive. And there are a lot of perennials that really are very attractive through the whole season, even though they're not blooming. And one of my favorites is this. This is a dwarf form of the Baptisio australis, or false indigo, called uh, minor. And it has a really pretty flowers in the spring, but then it also just has a beautiful habit throughout the season. It's just a really good garden plant. If you are going to pick plants based on their flower, you might want to know select those that are going to bloom for a really long period of time. And there are some perennials that will bloom six weeks even more, but they're, they're few and far between. We do have a list on our website of, of perennials that bloom more than six weeks, but the, the one on the, uh, on the right here, this is um, Salvia verticillata purple rain. That is a great salvia. If you deadhead that, that blooms all season. It's a different species than the salvia most of you are probably familiar with. At the top, uh, that's Corytalus lutea. We saw in an earlier slide that Corytalus bulbosum, that was that carpet of purple early in the spring. That one goes dormant. This one blooms in deep shade, in soil with no nutrients um, from June till hard frost. It's one of the longest blooming perennials. It it's Corytalus lutea. In the middle, um, that's Calamantha uh, Montrose white. That picture was taken in late October. That was blooming since June. And you want to be a little careful with the Calamantha because you only want to get the sterile, the, the sterile varieties. Montrose white and there's a blue one called uh, 
uh, Nepatoides subspecies Nepatoides. Those are the sterile ones. Some of the other varieties, well, we learned the hard way, blue cloud and white cloud, they seed all over the place. Um, and then the plant on the, the left, that's Nepeta souvenir to Andre. And uh, Nepeta souvenir to Andre chedrone. And it's one of my very, very favorite plants, blooms all summer, hummingbirds love it. We can't get it anymore. We can't find it anywhere. Fortunately, we do have some stock we're gonna be able to take cuttings from, but um, the uh, wholesaler that we used to buy it from, they said, oh, we, we got rid of it because it had too long of a name. <laughs> and then, of course, the plant that it's partnered with there is a really great plant that blooms all year, <laughs> and it grows in sun or shade, and it doesn't even require watering. And mistake falling for a picture of a pretty face. And I don't, I did take these pictures off the internet and I don't want to imply that these are not great daylilies because I don't know anything about these particular daylilies. But what I did is I just looked for really incredible looking daylilies. And if you saw that picture, in a catalog, you know, you would say, wow, I want to I want to have that. But what do you really know about it? Besides, that's what one flower looks like. And there's so much more to know about a plant. And we do grow about 400 varieties of daylilies at the farm. And um, so if you can go and you can actually see that plant, ideally in a garden situation, and this is where going to the botanic gardens or going to the garden tours is great too, you're gonna see not just the individual flower, but you're gonna see how many flowers are on that plant, how well branched are they, how are they distributed on the plant, what does the foliage look like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that are really important considerations for having an attractive um, and satisfying garden plant. And um, so that, that is what I have to show you in terms of the slides. And um, thank you very much.